So uh, to finish up then with the paralogisms of pure reason, um, <clears throat> we have the third paralogism of personality. And the third paralogism is that which is conscious of the numerical identity of itself at different times is insofar a person. Uh, so it has to do with the stability of the self, the stability of the consciousness of myself at different times uh, is ascribed by with the paralogisms of reason as though it were an actual property of the soul, uh, which it isn't any more than substance is or any more than simplicity are. Uh, if we look back, though, um, at the three predicates that we have looked at so far that have been the basis for the paralogisms of rational psychology, by means of which it pretends to extend our knowledge of the soul, uh, what we have are three different predicates. Substance, that the soul is a substance, that it is a simple substance and not a complex substance, and that uh, it has a unity uh, that gives to my personality a self-identity through time. Those three predicates, the reason that Kant objects to their application to the soul is that uh, if, if we had these pure concepts, if, and they're just concepts, and we uh, wanted to make a scientific observation, it would have to be the case then that we would have to have an intuition, uh, a synthetic intuition given to us in a manifold that these three concepts could then be applied to. But because we can produce no corresponding intuition of the soul to which these th three predicates can be said to adhere, the way we can say of, of a material object uh, in science, uh, we can't produce the soul. We can't produce the I except as a formal synthetic unity of representation. But we can't produce it as a thing. And uh, as a result of that, we, we can't have any science of the soul. Then. So there can't be any, any basis for a rational uh, psychology to exist claiming that it has actual knowledge of what the nature of the soul, because it would then have to treat the soul as though it were a physical thing, or at least something given an intuition, whereas the I, according to Kant, uh, has no intuition that corresponds to it. It's purely a formal unity that is the, the unity of that perception that enables us to confer synthetic unity on the manifold of appearances given to us through intuition. Um, and that's all it is in Kant. It's just that function. Even though he says that these ideas as concepts, the soul is simple, that it's a substance that it produces through time, gives to my personality the basis of unity, in a practical sense, we can use them in a manner of speaking in that way, but, but uh, not for having or pretending to form a science that is based upon any of this. Then in the fourth paralogism, of course, he moves on into um, not the soul itself, but a, uh, a critique of Cartesian idealism in which it's assumed that the existence of the outer world, um, it says, uh, that the fourth paralogism is that the, uh, that the existence of which can only be inferred as a cause of given perceptions has a merely doubtful existence. And so this doesn't pertain to the reality of the soul so much as it does to Descartes' doubt about the outer world and his saying that the outer world can only be inferred immediately, not immediately. And then Kant proceeds once again to attack Descartes as he has done earlier and to say that the whole problem with Descartes is that he has reified, he has, he has constructed a dualism of res extensa, a realm of things that treats uh, things out in space as though they were things in themselves, and a realm of res cogitans, or a realm of thought. And only the realm of thought is that about which he can be certain. The realm of things spread out in space and time he can't be certain about, uh, unless he, of course, brings in God to help improve the reality of the external world, which is what he ends up doing. But uh, the idea is that uh, Kant's critique of Descartes is that Descartes fails to make with regard to the, the so-called outer world, he fails to make the distinction that Kant makes between appearance and things in themselves. Kant splits the outer world into representation on the one hand and a realm of actual things in, in themselves that exist independently of our perception of them. But that thing in itself, that transcendental object, is out of bounds of any possible experience since we, we, can't, we, we can only experience the world insofar as the faculties of our psyche condition it for us. That's all we've got. The outer world is a mystery. The transcendental object is, is a complete mystery. But what we have then, what appears to us to be a world spread out in space and time and subject to the law of causality is mere appearance. These are representations of the outer world. Descartes mistakes them, as does Leibniz, for things in themselves. And they end up with these bizarre uh, dualisms. And Leibniz has to come up with a pre-established harmony uh, to come up with a, a very um, clumsy machine by means of which God has set 
events in the outer world in sync with the events of the soul so that there's this weird pre-established harmony between them because once again he has made a mistake in thinking that objects in space and time are things in themselves not mere appearances that are simply alterations of my inner sense my inner sensibility um, so space is in, in a certain sense in Kant it's it's an it's an illusion I mean it's real but it's 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 a condition it's it's a form of our outer sense that determines our experiences and so this is his critiques of the four paralogisms of reason by means of which in his day psychology which was still considered to be a branch of philosophy rational psychology could not exist as a science but it had not yet uh, gotten to the point where psychology of course came out of medicine out of empirical medicine and emerged on completely different principles as a science than what Kant was talking about here and it's really what he's calling rational psychology is really simply uh, Cartesian and Leibnizian philosophy basically it's, it's not he's critiquing ideas about the soul as a, as a thinking substance versus the outer world as extended in space-time um, so for Kant then these ideas these concepts these predicates of the soul as simple the soul as a substance the soul as unity and so forth are just that they're ideas and they can be uh, they're mere concepts uh, they have a transcendental application that is to say no application at all since they don't have an intuitive correlate and therefore they're only ideas and they're only figures of speech and they can be used accordingly as figures of speech and so for Kant we begin to get this idea that the ideas about the soul even though he does believe in the reality of the soul but for science the ideas of the soul are merely metaphors now it's worth stating that um, <clears throat> Young, Carl Jung, read, who read Kant on Sundays, uh, was enormously influenced by Kant, and indeed his entire worldview is shaped by Kant. Uh, and I think that there's a point where we can say that the entire subsequent history of comparative mythology and analytical psychology, as Jung founded it, theorized it, and as Joseph Campbell popularized it, uh, is the direct outcome of these Kantian insights that basically imprisons the entirety of the outer world inside the cavern of the human skull. And that also includes religious ideas, which now become mere metaphors, divested of any kind of ontological reality. And so all the ideas uh, for Jung, uh, the, the ideas of the reason, basically uh, become are hypostatized, hypostatized, but in the collective unconscious. His archetypes of the collective unconscious are innate, just as Kant's categories of the understanding are innate, but not the ideas of the reason. But uh, Jung takes the ideas of the reason and puts them as innate ideas in the collective unconscious so that they are the operative forms of the human imagination, which is the same everywhere, according to Jung. But notice then that we've imprisoned the entirety of all the imagery of all the great world religions and spiritual experiences, be they of yogis or mystics, inside the cave of the human skull. No ontological reality corresponds to them at all. They are merely ideas under the influence of Kantian idealism here. And I think that this has had a deleterious influence on the subsequent evolution of myth studies, and I think is largely what accounts what has accounted for its decimation and its dissolution, because it's become a dogmatic idea that the ideas of myth and religion are purely ideas. They don't refer to the reality of a spiritual world, as they do, for example, in Rudolf Steiner, uh, who is regarded as a heretic by the Jungians. Uh, for precisely that reason, that they, they don't have any correlate to anything real. They're mere metaphors and figures of speech, and consequently you get a gunslinging empiricist like Joseph Campbell talking about religious ideas who believes nothing in them. For him, religious ideas are mere figures of speech and just poetry. Uh, so his work fits better for an English professor than it does in religious studies. The English professor studies literature as metaphor. Uh, and so we've had a decimation in the field of religious studies, largely as the result of, of taking this dogmatic point of view that ritual, myth, and symbol don't have any ontological validity to them, and the experiences of yogis and mystics aren't experiencing anything real. They're just diving into the, uh, the plasma pool of the collective unconscious and reifying their experiences as though they had some kind of objective ontological validity. Now, I'm well aware, don't write notes on my page that tell me that Jung had a late period about synchronicity in which he was moving into a larger idea I'm well aware of that about something out there as well as, as something in here I'm well aware of that I'm talking about the influence of the Jungian point of view on the field of myth studies has been to create a dogma that is anathematized anyone who dis disagrees with it 
such as Rudolf Steiner, or let's say uh, anyone who's taken another approach to myth outside of the Jungian model, such as Emanuel Velikovsky or Hertha von Dachen, or any of these figures that came up with non-Jungian, Robert Graves is a classic example, non-Jungian approaches to myth are anathematized and regarded as heretics. Anyone who doesn't believe in the Jungian theory that uh, mythic images are simply figures of speech uh, is a heretic. And this is why I left the field of myth studies when I realized that it was a done deal. It was exhausted largely as a, as a result of the deleterious influence of Kant on Jung and of Jung on Campbell, and Campbell's popularizing the idea uh, that myths are merely ideas and don't refer to anything real. Uh, and the public, of course, uh, swallows everything from the media that it receives as though it were, in fact, real. So there hasn't been any development in that field, and it's come to a screeching halt. It's basically a done deal. It's, it's dead. Uh, because it needs fresh ideas and nobody seems willing to open their arms to any kind of fresh perspective that looks at ritual and symbol and myth from the point of view that Steiner, for example, just to take a random figure, saw it as referring to actual super sensible worlds, realities, spiritual realities that indeed most of ritual, symbol and myth is metaphor. A lot of it is metaphor, but a lot of it are metaphors that refer to realities that the metaphors are the best means of approach they don't exactly capture the realities, the spiritual realities, but they're the only means of approach that we have to them outside of becoming a yogi or a mystic and experientially diving into that world and experiencing it for ourselves. For ourselves. So the Kantian Jungian point of view, I think, tends to rob from mystical states of transcendence their experiential validity in denying to them any kind of reality outside the mere ideas that turn all of this into a giant sort of painting on the walls of a cave inside the mind. And this is the reason why I left that whole, that whole dimension of uh, ritual symbol and myth behind. So it's just worth being aware that as Kant is talking about uh, the impossibility of a rational psychology as a discipline, as a valid science, it's, th this was the effect that he did have on psychology, uh, assuming that you know these, these metaphors about the soul having a being separate from the body, that they're just metaphors. Well, maybe it's, they're not metaphors. Maybe the soul does exist independently from the body. Maybe it does survive into an afterlife. Uh, the Kantian theory can't account for that. And uh, for those kinds of ideas, we have to result to experience, the experience of yogis, of near-death experiences, all these other states that give us access experientially into these modes uh, that Kant is saying here is not a possibility in science. But... Uh, the history of science, I think, has, has other things to say about this than, than a mere Kantian uh, dogmatism.